Good morning. My name is Kristen Carroll. I'm the CEO at Rescue Agency, and I'm joined this morning by my esteemed colleague, Dr. Dana Wagner. She will be sharing some of our research with you today. And to start with, I'll just introduce Rescue. Uh, we're actually a behavior change marketing agency headquartered here locally in San Diego. We've been around since 2001. And for over 17 years, we've been working exclusively in the field of positive behavior change programs. We focus on health behaviors such as tobacco, physical activity, healthy eating, opioids, marijuana, sexual health, and alcohol use. These are all things that tend to surround the environments of disconnected youth. We have over 180 full-time staff across North America. We're a full-service agency, including research, strategy, creative implementation, and evaluation. Think of us as an advertising agency that works exclusively with nonprofits and public health organizations that are looking to promote positive, healthy behaviors, instead of to sell cars or fast food. We maintain a science-driven approach where we have a library of publications on staff PhDs, including my colleague here, Dana, and we generate multiple scientific grants for behavior change research. Our clients include the FDA and their Center for Tobacco Products, as well as over 22 different states across the country, ranging from Vermont to Virginia to Arkansas to New Mexico. And locally here, we work with San Diego Unified School District. And it's so wonderful to be here in San Diego. We do this work every day, but it is super special to be here, and it is incredibly important to be here. And we at Rescue, we're over by Mission Bay, uh, we're happy to be supporting this local conversation because it's so critical. So every single day, we think around our six offices around, across the country, how can we prevent youth from smoking? How can we convince people to eat healthy? How can we share the risks of binge drinking and make them real? How can we reduce violence? And how can we encourage safe sex? These are the questions and the challenges that we're thinking about on a daily basis. We think about them with youth audiences in mind, and we also think about them as appropriate with adult audiences in mind. Today, though, is all about the youth. Now, one of the challenges is that when we're thinking about youth, we, make we need to make sure that we understand our audience first. Now, when we work with public health departments and nonprofits all over the country, the first thing we ask is, who are you talking to? Who is your laser-focused target audience? Because in order to create positive change, we must understand our audience first. And too many times when we're working with many of our clients, they're looking at trying to reach everyone. But one of the challenges is when we try to reach everyone, what happens? We often reach no one. And so I want to give you some examples of typical, uh, typical displays of public health communications that are out there with greatest of intentions, looking to reduce tobacco use, for example, or encourage healthy eating, or reduce binge drinking. But let's watch together and think about whether or not these pieces of communications actually hit the mark and are encouraging the right behaviors. Let's take a look. One in three kids who smoke will die from it. Okay, that's a really important message. One in three kids who smoke could die from it. Is that relatable to a youth? What do we see when we see the youth in the, the rowboat? Has any of, any of us been in a rowboat when we were youth like that? We are in Rhode Island here, but that may or may not be a realistic everyday situation. What do we see when you think about or when you see those kids? Those kids are examples of potentially normal kids, maybe not the highest at-risk kids for smoking, and they tend to represent conveniently each of the racial groups that we want to make sure that we talk to when we're talking about public health. The challenge is that this ad, for example, does not put the audience first. It does not stand in the shoes of a youth to understand why they may actually engage in this behavior. When we think about healthy eating, you know, here are some examples of healthy eating ads, right? 
get in shape, uh, eat right, beat diabetes. This young, smart, good-looking gentleman here, healthy eating from head to toe, I'm sure after he sees this, he's going to go home and eat some vegetables, right? These are all really important messages, good information. The question is, are they going to change behavior? And here's a favorite one of mine. When we think about the topic of alcohol use, binge drinking, particularly among young audiences, take a look here. So when I'm thinking about going out for a night, I'm certainly not thinking about that. And so the challenge is, when we're thinking about creating an intervention, let's take alcohol use as an example, this poor gentleman is not thinking about this type of behavior before he's headed out. And when he's about to take that fifth drink, this is not what's crossing his mind. There's another type of communication or another message that could intervene and intercept that behavior at that point in time. And we need to better understand the audience that we're talking to in order to make sure that the messages that we create are effective. So the question today is, how do we put our audience first? And how do we connect with disconnected youth? So, Taking a look and, and building upon what Andy shared this morning, you know, there are 4.9 million young people in America that are disconnected. And that's a staggering statistic, right? Now, I'm not sure that all of these great looking young people in matching hoodies are the face of our disconnected youth. And if they are, they may be the easiest to reconnect back into our society. And so we need to be really careful as community advocates and communicators to make sure that we're representing our youth in the communications materials and in the conversations that we're having. Because really, at the end of the day, this is not about us, and this is not about a stock photo of beautiful children. This is about the, the kids who need the help the most. Now, as Andy shared, we've made incredible progress in recent years. So being able to you know, take a number like 14.7% disconnected youth and actually move the needle down to 11.7% is incredible progress. But when we look deeper and we look at a lot of this information, this is from Measure for America and the Social Science Research Council, um, 2018, what we're seeing is that when we think about the different types of youth within that bigger number, there are significant disparities. In fact, there's a 20-point gap between Native American youth and Asian youth. But even more challenging than that is that the measure of someone's or the impact of someone's um, chance of being disconnected from our schools or from a workforce is not directly correlated to the color of their skin. While it is certainly related, it is not the only driver. And there's so much more we need to understand about our youth in order to, order to effectively reach them. In fact, what got us here at 11.7% is not going to get us there. It is not going to allow us to move forward and continue to push the gap down because we've probably reached some of the low-hanging fruit and maybe even some of the harder fruit to grasp. But being able to move the needle even further is going to require different strategies and different thinking because these kids need different type of help and they help and they need to be communicated to in a different way. So one principle that I want to start out our conversation with is you're thinking about developing communications or reaching out to youth. There's a common principle I want us all to keep in mind, which is number one, all teens are not the same. This is really important because we need to better understand each individual youth, understand how to make sure that we're seeing common themes, and understand how we can create programs and marketing communications that will reach them. We talk a lot about at Rescue this idea of a prism. 
And so when we think about all disconnected youth, we're pulling them in at the beginning. They all have mixed values. They've encountered different things in their life. They have different reasons for their situation. What we try to do when we understand youth at a deeper, deeper level is use this process of segmentation. Segmentation allows us to take those mixed values and actually identify clear and distinct values that enable us to communicate directly to the people who need the communications the most. And this is really important, and it's something we've been working on for years and years. We call this te teen peer crowd segmentation. Now, over a period of about 10 years plus, we've been able to create a study. We have called it the iBase study. And that iBase study is something that we've administered to tens of thousands of teens. And when we're looking at trying to understand how teens form and actually group together, we give them this survey. It's all about pictures. And when you put uh, words in front of teens or even adults, there's a lot of loaded meaning to words. So we use pictures instead. And what we're looking for is how groups hang together, right? And so this is a very simple exercise. Rank the three people that would best fit into your group of friends and then rank the three people that would least fit into your group of friends. And by going through this exercise, we're able to identify how teens see themselves, how they identify themselves inside of the bigger peer crowd, inside of the social environment that they sit within. And what we've been able to see after years and years of data is that there are clusters that form. And these clusters are important to us in terms of being able to properly segment teens, but then also to properly communicate and develop relevant messages to them. So we have over here on the left-hand side mainstream, we have the popular teens. We have a teen, call, teen group called hip hop, country, and alternative. And we'll talk a little bit about each of these groups next. One thing that's really important, because I always get this from our public health clients, is that when we think about segmentation, it is about inclusion and not exclusion. One of the biggest challenges we have is not trying to communicate to everyone with the same message. And if you really think about it, the ability to represent different types of identities and values in messaging is all about including their ideas and including them in a conversation instead of excluding them. So before we worry about whether or not we're segmenting populations or stereotyping, let's think about how are we actually making communications more relevant and how are we be better representing different groups inside of our programs. So mainstream, mainstream teens. Here we are, these are smiling, wonderful teens who generally have something in their life, whether that be sports or student council or even church, that centers them and that is their focus point so that they essentially don't get into trouble. They are able to identify something in their life that is incredibly important to them and they center their goals, their friend circles, their social circles around that specific activity. Now, it's not that these children or these teens are not at risk, but it happens that they have a North Star that they're working with that helps guide them along the way and bring them back despite challenges coming their way. The popular teens tend to, tend to set the trends, right? These are teens who uh, are popular on Instagram. They're using social media to represent their life. They're trying to show something and create something and create a story around who they are. Country teens. Now, we do a lot of work all over the country. So even in San Diego, we have country teens. And when we think about country teens, these are folks who not only listen to country music, and you are going to see music themes here, but think deeper in how important country music is to telling stories about someone's life, right? The patriotism, the independence, the ability to stand on one's own two feet. These are all principles that we see in country teens. Now, I'm sharing these stories with you, and it may seem odd in a public health environment, but what we all should know to be true is that commercial marketers have used segmentation for years and years, and in fact, they use segmentation every day to make the messages that they send to us connect with very specific audiences. And let me show you an example of this from a very uh, popular beverage company. Let's take a look. Go ahead. 
let your beard down and crack a dew shine. There will be some country with Mountain Dew. And in fact, Mountain Dew has actually gone and targeted the country audience, whether they be teen or adults, for years and years. When we think about hip hop, this is not just about music. And let's be clear, hip hop transcends racial boundaries. Hip hop is all about overcoming the struggle, being something bigger than what you came from. And what we find in hip hop youth is that they are constantly on the go looking for future opportunity. They're looking at music expressing themselves and music is a gateway into something bigger. And we think about hip hop, you know, we're not the only ones that see this trend. Mountain Dew, they're targeting hip hop as much as they're targeting country. In high school, when you can start in elementary school, why make one platinum album when you can make five? Why stop at rapping when you can skate too? Why be anyone else when I can do me? I'm Lil Wayne and this is how I do me. Why I do it alone? When I got the do nation. Lil Wayne's got the do nation. And also what's so important here is he's got an entire community that's shouting his name, that's supporting him, that's all around him. And if you know anything about Mountain Dew advertising in the last little while, they dropped Lil Wayne. And the Super Bowl commercial from 2018 had a battle with Morgan Freeman, of all people, doing a rap doing hip hop, they went a little bit of a safer route on the mainstream media for the Super Bowl to make sure that they were reaching the hip hop audience. And then we've got our alt teens, and we find these in schools. These are the kids that you know, stereotypically are wearing black and have tattoos and piercings. But more importantly, these teens are all about anti-establishment, about carving their own path, about being independent, they're into art, they're into expressing themselves. They're much more than folks that are walking around wearing black hoodies. And interestingly, we do see that teen peer crowds change over time. This extreme group or this alternative group did look a little bit different years ago. In fact, Mountain Dew started their work and started their segmentation with extreme alternative youth. Let's take a look back in the time machine, shall we? Wow, that was some bright colors, huh? So when we see this today, all we can think is, wow, that's incredibly cheesy. But back circa 1994, these are people who are independent, doing things that no one else would ever do, right? And Mountain Dew is also always about expressing that independence and expressing that alternative viewpoint and doing something that was not the norm. Principle number two, when we think about reaching teens, is that who you are often motivates behavior more powerfully than what you know. We can tell a youth that smoking may increase the, the, the potential for cancer, or that binge drinking might cause you to have a night that you don't want to remember, or that healthy eating will prolong your life and give you more energy. But just because we know something doesn't mean that we act on that knowledge. And this is one of the most fundamental behavior change principles that we see all the time is that we have to make sure that we understand how to connect with people on their values and identities versus just the knowledge. Because if we all knew that eating healthy and eating more vegetables was going to make us have more energy, we'd all do it every day, right? Peer crowds matter because they are the combination, not just of these values and identities, who your friends are, your social connections, but those life experiences, the values and attitudes that you have that assemble these peer crowds, they drive your behavior in ways that you may not even understand on a conscious level. And so we're constantly trying to understand how can we really identify with youth and understand who they are, walk a mile in their shoes, and determine how we can move them towards positive, healthy behaviors in a way that is natural for their daily life, that is integrated into who they believe they are. 
When we look deeper at the country peer crowd, we understand that country teens are patriotic. They enjoy the outdoors and hunting. They have strong and broad family ties. Their extended family is critically important to them. They look out for each other. They're traditionalists, right? They're conservatives. They have a strong pass down culture. Grandparents, parents have a legacy that they leave their children, their extended family that's incredi incredibly important. And they enjoy tinkering with machines and fixing up things like trucks and four wheelers. So Mountain Dew knew that. They knew that that ATV was gonna connect with someone on a deeper level. Now, when we think about creating public health messages, we are identifying these values and thinking about, for example, how can we position tobacco as something that is not going to support the values and identity that run deep inside of someone, and how can we make sure that we're presenting the argument in a way that is incredibly relevant to their daily life. So let's take a look at one example of how we've done that for country teens. My family has a deep legacy around here, and we look out for each other. My folks and their relatives, my aunt and the little ones, even grandma down the way, we got each other's backs. Even when it comes to my little brother, he's really something, but he's one of the reasons I live tobacco free. Because if I use tobacco, my little brother is more likely to use it too, and that can cause him cancer down the line. I can't be the reason he does that. So for my family, I live tobacco free. Go to downanddirtylife.com slash looking out. So imagine you're a country teen and most public health messages are meant for everyone and you see something like this. And all of a sudden you're understanding that this behavior, this risk behavior, you're not thinking about it that way of course, but this could actually jeopardize or put in jeopardy things that you value the most, your family, your little brother, right? You look at the tone and the imagery in this ad, it's a little slower, it's very conscious, right? This is an, an ad that's not made for 90%, 95% I would guess of us in the room. It's made for a very specific target audience and it's all about including them in the message. Now let's take a completely different group. Let's take a look at hip hop. And here you'll see examples of tobacco ads that are specifically targeted to this group. In fact, tobacco companies for years have known that if they are able to connect with this audience, if they are able to connect with this lifestyle, they can weave themselves into the fabric of the culture in a way where it's the norm to smoke. When we do focus groups with youth, uh, all across the country of all ethnic groups that would qualify themselves or would be categorized as hip hop, they cannot name one hip hop artist that doesn't smoke. It's just part of the culture, right? Everyone does it because people don't go around saying proudly, I don't smoke. It's just not part of our vernacular. In fact, the behavior is just woven into everything we do in the culture itself. So at Rescue, one of our goals as we work with the FDA and the Center for Tobacco Products is to change the norms around hip hop and around how people within these communities actually see tobacco. We wanna create a tobacco free environment instead of a tobacco oriented environment. Let's take a look at the first ad that we ever broke. This was first launched in October of 2015 with the FDA Center for Tobacco Products, and it was focused exclusively on reaching this audience. They're all about overcoming life struggles, uh, value, they value culturally relevant success, they care about being fashionable. When we create ads, we make sure that we put attention to how people look, are they looking fresh, right? It's all coming from them. We are just giving them a platform to make sure that they can share how they would think about healthy behaviors. They care about being respected and known and strong and they're constantly seeing, seeking to take control of their life. You see, my mom's double shift wasn't in vain. Low achiever, at risk, disregarded, I will break that chain. Pain, disease, death, cigarettes were to blame, but I overcame the block. And the shock when my grandpa's lung cancer caused by cigarettes was caught. Distraught and left alone. Had three generations in one home. Not broken, but awoken. Setting sights on CEO of independence as my goal. So I reject cigarettes to regain control. Keep it fresh. Live tobacco free. And that's J Star giving her message. It's a true story about her family. It's someone that we found, and she was so passionate 
about this campaign and this message. She actually came and launched the campaign with the FDA at their national press conference. Now, the alternative teens, again, you're going to see here from the tobacco companies, Camel, The Flaming Lips, um, Break Free, a Rock Your Own Anthem. These are images that are targeted directly to the alternative crowd to bring tobacco into that lifestyle. Tobacco manufacturers are excellent at understanding how to fit inside of a culture. And we want to make sure that we send the counter message. Alternative teens are typically rebellious. They value creativity and individuality. They support local art and music. They want to make sure they're part of the scene. They're more responsive to personal messages, talking directly to them, right? They want to be seen and heard. And they are particularly influenced by bands who are both accessible and powerful. There's a local scene in almost every city where alt teens go to connect with people who are just like them. And it's really important to them. It is their community. It is their people. What's up, guys? It's Levi here from Miss May I. We're just here practicing and gearing up for our next big tour. Come check it out. There's a lot of stuff to do, like make the set list, pack, make sure all our gear is up and running, merchandise is ready to go. It's a lot of work, but it's totally worth it. Touring can be rough, but being smoke-free totally helps. Cigarettes hurt my body and my stamina in a live show, and there's nothing metal about inhaling toxic chemicals and cigarettes. We're Miss May I. Stay metal and support a smoke-free scene. Check out Psych's new contest at facebook.com slash psych. Again, if you're not in the scene, you probably don't know Miss May I, but if you are in the scene, you know exactly who they are. And it's meaningful that there's a message like this coming directly from them. Now, I've shared with you so far this idea that values and identity are important to understanding how the social fabric works, how the social connection works. But what's so important is that there's a deeper level of understanding that we've just gained uh, that informs how we talk to them and why we talk to specific groups. So values and identities actually inform the risk profiles, and they identify areas for us to create the most positive change. And I want to introdu introduce Dr. Wagner now, who's going to take you through some of our research, because this research that we've done in understanding how these peer crowds cluster is just the start. We also now understand how these peer cards peer crowds relate to very specific risk behaviors that are directly connected to our disconnected youth. So thank you, Kristen. Um, I have an amazing opportunity at Rescue as a researcher um, to be part of this integration of data into the work that we do every single day. So I want to talk to you about three different studies um, and some of the cutting edge data that we're finding on peer crowds and these different sort of risk profiles. The first one I want to share with you um, is from the state of Virginia. Um, this is from the Virginia Youth Health Survey. So we had an amazing opportunity with our clients at the Virginia Foundation for Healthy Youth to include the iBase survey, which Kristen described earlier, as our survey methodology in order to identify peer crowd influence among teens to be included in the YRBS. So this is the CDC's um, prevalence data. They, it gets implemented all over the US. And so we get to report on various types of risk factors as it's associated with peer crowds. Great opportunity. There are over 5,000 high school students who participated across 83 high schools throughout Virginia. These data were collected in the fall of 2015, um, and this is conducted every two years. So we have new data coming from the fall of 2017 that we're really excited about as well. Um, the school response rate was 100%, which is amazing, and 84% of teens responded to the survey. This is a snapshot of the percentage of peer crowds that we see in the state of Virginia. So this is going to give you an idea of um, how we see the distribution, and then I'll talk to you a little bit more about the risk levels. We measure peer crowds in two different ways. Um, the green bars represent primary influence. So that tells us which peer crowd has the most influence for a teen. So you can only be counted once in this category. The gray bars represent any influence. So a teen could have multiple peer crowd influences in their lives. So for example, they may report influence from the popular peer crowd and the hip hop peer crowd. And they would be counted in both categories here. So we can see in Virginia, most teens are falling in the popular category, followed by mainstream, then hip hop, country, and alternative. These data are telling us risk behaviors by peer crowds. So across the bottom of the screen here, you can see each of the peer crowds, and a series of slides I'm going to show you are set up the same exact way. The green bars are telling us if that peer crowd is significantly less at risk than the average teen in Virginia, 
and the pink bars are telling us if they're significantly more at risk than the average teen. So for example, currently used tobacco, we see that hip hop and alternative teens are more at risk for using tobacco at 36.3% and 34.1%, and this is compared to 22.1% overall in Virginia. Mainstream teens are significantly less at risk, 7.9%. But then when we look at various tobacco products, actually, this changes a little bit. Currently smoked cigarettes. Alternative teens are almost three times as likely to say that they are smoking cigarettes currently at 20.8%, compared to just 7.9% on average. 2.8% of mainstream teens are reporting this. So they're significantly less at risk. Um, in terms of binge drinking, drink five or more drinks of alcohol in a row. Hip hop teens at 17.2% are significantly at risk here. Again, mainstream teens, 3.2%. Currently used marijuana, more than twice the level of risk for hip hop teens, 34.2% compared to 5.9% for mainstream. So now getting into illicit drug use, currently took a prescription drug without a doctor's prescription, which is the important distinction there. More than two times the risk for hip hop teens, 14.7. 1.8% for mainstream teens. That's a pretty big disparity, right? Currently took over the counter drugs to get high. Hip hop teens, 10.6% compared to 4.2% on average. Mainstream teens are generally not doing this, 0.6%. So now we want to get into issues of safety at school. We're bullied on school property. Look at alternative teens. More than twice as likely to say that they were bullied on school property at 38% compared to 17.8% overall. Reported there is at least one teacher or other adult in their school they can talk to if they have a problem. This one's really interesting. So hip hop teens and alternative teens, while they're about 50%, significantly lower than the average, which is 60.9%. And then country teens, so Kristen mentioned a lot about the values um, of family and connecting with adults. And we see that this is a protective factor for country teens here, where they're reporting that they can really talk to adults. In terms of emotional health and mental health, felt sad or hopeless. Alternative teens, 62.5% that they said, said that they felt sad or hopeless. And in the less risk category, popular teens are about 22% and country teens at 25%. So they're doing pretty well in terms of mental health. We really need to pay attention to alternative teens here though. Strongly agree or agree that they feel good about themselves. So this is sort of the opposite end of the spectrum. Popular teens are above average at 76.7. We see that hip hop and country teens are pretty close to the average or above, but they're not really significantly different. Alternative teens, again, we need to pay attention, 33.6%. In terms of suicide, made a plan about how they would attempt suicide. Alternative teens at 34.5% compared to 10.8% overall actually attempted suicide. We see alternative teens are the highest here with 17.8%. And hip hop is also popping here, 11.2. We see that they had some elevated risk for the attempt suicide, but it wasn't significantly different. And it's really coming out here that they're more likely to report that they're attempting suicide. With popular teens at the least risk, followed by mainstream. We're in a physical fight. Hip hop teens, 33.3% were threatened or injured with a weapon on school property, alternative teens, are 13.2% of them, are saying that this happened to them. We want to switch gears here for a second. Um, you know, these, what I've presented so far are um, various health behaviors, safety-related mental health, but we also know that disconnected women are more than four times likely to be mothers, and so we really want to address the issue of teen pregnancy. And we do have a study um, that we conducted nationally online that was assessing teen pregnancy risk as well as perceptions of pregnancy among teens, and we used our peer crowd segmentation approach for this. So we find um, using a teen pregnancy risk scale um, that 39% of hip hop teens are reporting that they are maybe at risk for a teen pregnancy. Interestingly, our other high risk group that we were identifying in the other data, alternative teens are significantly less at risk, only 6% here. So we can say that we have these consistent risk profiles associated with hip hop and alternative teens, but they're clearly manifesting themselves very differently across different areas of life. So the question is, what is going on here with hip hop teens? 
well, we have three different questions that we ask them to try to figure out what are the associations with pregnancy and the way that they feel about it. Um, feel closer to your partner, feel excited, and feel more grown up. Look at the green bars. Hip hop teens are more likely to say all of these things. So when we're thinking about messages about safe sex, we all cannot forget that there's also a deeper message about values and the associations that are, had, are to be had with teen pregnancy overall. What does it mean for them? Well, it means connection. It means having people around. It means feeling grown up. So how do we reach them with tailored messages in this way and not just talk about using birth control? Overall, I just want to give a quick summary here. So we've talked about highest risk peer crowds um, and alternative and hip hop are really showing up as the highest risk. For alternative, it's in terms of tobacco, specifically cigarettes. This includes depression and suicide as well. For hip hop, tobacco, marijuana, binge drinking, and pregnancy are all behaviors we need to be paying attention to. But we know that risk behaviors don't really start in teen years, right? And we have um, some hypotheses that peer crowds and the basis for them start really early and they have to do with experiences that you have in your life. So we have some new data that we want to share with you um, where we are exploring adverse childhood experiences. It's called an ACE scale. Um, we conducted a study um, where we were able to include this. Um, it was nationally online. The scale is from zero to nine. Um, it's a measure from the National Survey of Children's Health, and the items include experienced household financial difficulty, parent, parent guardian divorce or separation, parent or guardian death, parent or guardian's time in jail, saw or heard parents or adults slap, hit, kick, or punch one another in the home, lived with someone who was mentally ill, suicidal, or severely depressed, lived with someone who had a drug or alcohol problem, experienced or witnessed violence in the neighborhood, and was treated or judged unfairly because of race or ethnicity. So ACE is directly associated with child development, shaping who someone becomes as a teen and a young adult, and we're also seeing that it's associated with peer crowd influence. So when examining ACE in peer crowds, we found that two peer crowds, alternative and hip hop, reported significantly greater number of ACEs on average than other peer crowds. So the average is 2.41, so that means they were reporting about two and a half adverse experiences on average across the sample. However, this is elevated significantly for alternative teens who are reporting 3.61 and hip hop who are reporting 3.31. So we want to dig into this deeper because we know that all risk is not the same. We want to know controlling for demographics. So this is holding equal things like race and ethnicity and gender. Um, how does a score impact pure crowd? So this is telling us that a one point increase in a score was associated with a 16% increase in odds of identifying as hip hop and a 20% increase in odds of identifying as alternative. This is telling us that negative experiences is manifesting through risk in very specific ways. We broke this down even further. There are different types of questions on the ACE scale. So we separate them into two categories. One is about home experiences. This is associated with um, household financial difficulty, parental experiences. The other is about environmental experiences, witnessing neighborhood violence or racism, experiencing racism. We find that this is where peer crowds very clearly diverge. Alternative teens are significantly more likely to report adverse home experiences, where hip hop teens are significantly more likely to report adverse environmental experiences. So when we're talking to teens from these peer crowds, yes, we can say that there's significant evidence that they're both very much at risk, but the core of the experiences that they're having from childhood are so different and they're manifesting themselves so differently that they need to be approached in different ways and messaged to in very different ways in order to connect with them throughout their lifetime. Thank you, Dana. Incredible data. And it's so important to making sure that what we're intuitively seeing is also what we're seeing in the data. It reminds us that connecting with the disconnected 
means meeting them where they are. And we talk about this you know, among our halls all the time. None of our campaigns are about us, and all of our campaigns are about connecting with the target audience where they are. And that means understanding this background. And I want to share with you some of the background on this Fresh Empire campaign that I've referenced a few times. It's the FDA's national campaign to reduce tobacco among multicultural youth. And I want to share with you a story of one of our influencers who we're celebrating and supporting from the ground up. It's really like a, a 24 hour job to a life. But at the end of the day, this is what I want to do. Well, I go by the name Nova. I'm 16 years old. I'm from Reading, PA, and I'm, I'm a rapper. Growing up in my city was a lot of challenges, you know. Reading was um, um, number one poverty stricken one time in America. I'm thankful because, you know, since the show and everything, it's actually been helping the city out and letting people know that you, we can actually fulfill dreams and, you know, make it out, even as a kid. The way I got on the rap game was it was uh, it was kind of crazy actually. At first I didn't get the call back for the rap game for the second season, but it really didn't stop me. You know, it actually motivated me. It made me sit back and realize like, okay, I need to put in work now. I gotta go harder. So what I ended up doing was just posting freestyle videos on Instagram every day, I'm talking about a new freestyle every single day. It was just like go hard every day. Tag Jermaine Dupree. Hashtag rap game season three, and let's, let's actually put our city on the map. What made me gravitate to hip hop was really my uncle. You know, I used to watch his videos on YouTube and get inspired by him. He's nice. He raps, my sister sings, my cousin raps, my other uncle manages us, my mother, she does like, she's a mom again. And she also can tap into the music thing too. And I feel like just being around that environment of music and it, it just shaped me to just be, you know, who I am today. Having my family behind me and, and, and making it into the industry, and I really don't have to think about making a bad decision because they always look out for me at the end of the day. You've been positive, you've been crushing every show. I've been watching you and keeping the tabs on you, and I can't say anything else but like I'm, I'm more proud than I ever thought I would be. Being where I'm coming from and then being Puerto Rican on top of that is just, it's, you know, it's a lot on my back. I don't let that affect me, and I don't let it affect anything I do, and I just stick to the music. I don't want to introduce the smoke into my, my little brothers and sisters. You know, that's why I stay tobacco-free. So if I was to smoke cigarettes, they're more likely to smoke cigarettes, and that's not cool. I don't want that for them. My grandma was a heavy smoker. You know, she ended up passing away, rest in peace, so the cancer. You know, it was a rough time, but I like Fresh Empire, and I love the campaign they go with. Hey, it's no really young God, and I keep it fresh with Fresh Empire. Fresh Empire. Keep it fresh. Live tobacco free. Because here we are trying to share a message about tobacco prevention, but what were we talking about? We were talking about poverty and struggle and rejection and extended family and cancer. And all we did was find this young person, find Nova, put him in front of a camera and asked him questions. This is his story, and there's so many other stories like him. For us to be able to connect a tobacco prevention message with someone that relates to Nova, we have to make sure that we're putting him at the center stage, right? This isn't about hip hop and this isn't about dance. This is about the value system and who you are inside. And that's something that we hold really, really true with all of the work that we do. And it's not just enough to make sure that we're talking to them from where they are emotionally, but we also need to make sure that we're talking to them where they actually are. And let's talk about social media. We're creating conversations and change on social media every day. This is the first federally funded public health campaign that is spending more money on social media and events, events in local communities than on traditional media and television ads. Because our young people are not sitting down on the couch watching television ads expecting to hear that they shouldn't smoke cigarettes, right? They're living their life every day and if we wanna make sure that we're sending a message to them, we need to be where they are. And so we're on Snapchat and we're on Instagram stories and we're sharing messages and we're talking back to them. We had to work with the FDA to make sure that we have the ability to actually respond to people when they said, hey, Fresh Empire, shout out, or hey, I don't believe your facts. We had to make sure that we worked with the FDA to allow this conversation to happen. Because in some cases, the places where the most change happens is when someone challenges us and says we're wrong. And then we can actually go and have a conversation and say, well, let me show you the facts. Let me show you the data. 
And guess what? We've seen conversations turn around and we've seen youth turn around as a result of this. And so we make sure every day that we're out there where our youth are so we're connecting directly with them. Now let's talk about events. We do not believe that we could change behavior among this culture and change social norms among this culture if we were not out inside the culture itself. And so for the last two and a half years, we've hosted over a thousand events in 30 cities all over the country where we're bringing up and coming musicians and dancers and artists and rappers to communities that never had a place for kids to go after eight o'clock at night. Right? Where are these kids supposed to go? And we've created an environment that is safe and tobacco free and one where they can actually express themselves the way they want to. So let's take a look. So it's the youth themselves that are creating this tobacco-free movement. We're just giving them the platform to do so. When we started out at the beginning of our campaign in the fall of 2015, we would go to Atlanta's car and bike show, and we would go to a rap concert, and we would set up a tent, and we would set up our messaging, and kids would come to us. But what we knew is that that was just the start. We could go and insert ourselves into their culture, but ultimately our goal was to make sure that their culture embraced us. And so over the last two and a half years, we've evolved to creating our own branded events. And can you imagine going to the Federal Drug Administration in Silver Spring, Maryland, and pitching this to the folks sitting in their offices in the government? I'm not sure that they knew what they were signing up for back in early 2014 and 15, but when we presented this to the head of the Center of Tobacco Products, who, yes, is a white male, probably around the age of 60, he said, I got chills and I never knew this was possible. It's so exciting, and this is all about them. And we oftentimes get asked, well, don't you go and pay big rappers and don't you want the superstars to tell kids that this is what they should do? And the answer is absolutely not. We started out with J-Star, who was a young, aspiring musician. She just had a couple uh, tapes, mixtapes that were out there. We found her, we found her story. And the idea was to create a movement from the ground up to the place where we actually have those famous rappers who are not paid promoting us on social media. That's how the movement comes from the ground up. And so last summer, Eminem tweeted out and actually changed his Instagram profile. We could not believe this. Look at this green box. He changed the link on his Instagram profile to the freshempire.gov. Yes, it's a .gov website to make sure that people would go vote for Nissan, who is his up and coming hopeful in one of our rap battles. And just a few weeks ago, we had Diddy, who posted about his son, King Combs, performing at one of our events. And so here we are turning the tables from getting celebrities to tell youth how to act to getting youth to create the own movement, their own movement themselves. And that's what we wanted to create when we're thinking about how do we change behaviors from the inside and how do we make sure we're talking where our youth actually are. So the three principles I shared are all teens are not the same. Who you are influences you more than you know, those values and identities. And connecting with the disconnected means meeting them where they are. Now I know many of you in the, in the audience are now saying, well, gee, that's really cool, but I'm a local community organizer. How does this help me? And what can I do in my local community? We can apply these principles at a local level too, and I wanted to show you some of the work we're doing here in San Diego locally, that no, just FYI, it's not as flashy as P. Diddy, but it's equally important to connecting our disconnected youth. So San Diego Unified School District, uh, about 10 years ago, was trying and struggling with this question of how do we connect students 
with, how do we connect with students after school? Now we all know that there's this elementary program called Prime Time. If you've got a young child in elementary school, you know about Prime Time. If you're a young child in elementary school, you know about Prime Time. But what the heck happens when kids go to high school? Well, there is support for kids after school in high school. It was called the 21st Century Assets Grant. And to any teen, they would say that is totally the uncool zone. I don't know what that means, and I'm certainly not staying after school to figure that out. And so what they were struggling with is this idea of how do we actually create an after school program that connects with the kids who need it the most, who have nowhere to go after school, who don't have a safe place to be at home, who may not have supper waiting for them at home. How do we make sure that the purpose of this 21st assets, uh, assets grant fulfills itself and supports itself? And so Rescue started working with them to, to listen to the youth. Number one, we created focus group with teens. We went to these schools and we talked to the kids who needed support after school. We allowed them to identify themselves in a specific activity. We wanted to know what was important to them, what would keep them after school, what was compelling enough to make sure that they don't go find something better to do on a street corner somewhere. And we created programs that they individually asked for. And so instead of me telling you what we did, I'll just share that we allowed our students to create a brand. That brand is called I'm In, and I'm gonna allow them to share with you what that is all about. I'm In includes everything you can do after school. I'm In stands for I'm In something, like I'm In dance. I'm in drama. No matter what you're into, I'm in has something for everyone. What are you in? I am in glee club, I am in rugby club, and I am in the after school theater club. Theater to me is like a second family. My name is Cassandra and I'm in credit recovery. Without it, I wouldn't be able to graduate, I wouldn't be able to go to college. It would just slow down the process of like going to higher education. So I'm really glad that we have this opportunity to make everything up. Oh, I'm in dance, I'm in the YOU lounge, I'm in the art that's right next door. Obviously, I'm in a lot of things. <laughs> because of the I'm in clubs, I know for a fact that I have more people that I can talk to and relate to. I'm in the art of vines. It's fun, and they're the type of people that you could just come and be yourself around. I'm in helps me to be creative. I'm in dance. This dance club helps me bring out my creativity. Dance is my life, so. This is what I'm in, what are you in? I'm in fitness. Using this fitness gym helps me be a better athlete. This is what I'm in, what are you in? I'm Adelie and I'm in the Learning Lab. It's a pretty good experience to be able to be here and catch up on work. I'm in DJ in the making. Uh, this club has definitely inspired me to be a DJ in the future. Honestly, these are actually really cool programs. I mean, I love it a lot. Wanna stay out of trouble? Come to these clubs, you have a lot of fun here and you're staying out of trouble. My name is Tatiana Phillips and I'm in Space Lab. Uh, I actually do this every day after school to keep up with my fitness. What are you in? I personally love the aspects of the leadership training. It's helped me become an all-rounded person. In ninth grade year, I really wasn't academically focused or even really wanting to be at school, but you know, the program really changed me around. I love the, the guy, the DJs who say, yeah, this is actually pretty cool, right? And then you've got you know, the drill guy at the end who's like, I really wasn't into school in ninth grade. Like, I didn't really know why I was supposed to be here. And this gave me something to, to do and to own and to allow for me to express myself. And you'll see in this I'm in program, both students who are very involved, but also students who had the potential to be disconnected. Maybe they couldn't find their niche. These are not typically the students that are going out for varsity athletic programs or that are already involved in art or that are in music. These are the kids that are in between. And this allows, this program allows them to find their own niche. When the program first launched, here were the type of clubs that these students wanted. These are the type of clubs that they asked for. Cooking and dance and fitness, um, graffiti art, and cosmopo cosmetology. Today we have an environment where at 16 different sites all across San Diego, there are site leads that are leading programs that the students actually give input on. And the students across these high schools are choosing and helping to curate the programs that are gonna be most important to them that will keep them after school. 
It also creates an environment where there's a drop-in center, there's a place of stability where they can see the same person every single day after school. They serve supper and they allow kids to make sure that they get food before they do have to leave the school campus. Uh, the three asterisks here are school sites that Rescue actually runs and manages. Their flagship I'm in uh, I'm in sites and ones where every single day we're interacting with youth and we're hearing from them what's working and what's not working. And guess what? If something's not working, we change it. So I'll leave you today with an invitation because at the end of the I'm in year, we create what we call the I'm in showdown. It's here in San Diego, and it's an opportunity for many of the students across all of these high schools to showcase some of the things they've been doing all during the year. And it gives them an opportunity to be center stage and to showcase what they've been investing their time and energy in and what they're in. So I have one last video for you, and then I'll formally extend you the invitation. an amazing day here at USD campus in San Diego at the 2017 I'm in Showdown. It's so great watching my students practice their crafts all year long. Then they get a chance to come on stage and perform for an awesome crowd and connect with the greater I'm in community. This year's showdown was the best yet. My favorite part was when we had everyone in the auditorium and students from one site were cheering on students from another site they've never even met. That's what I'm in is all about. My name is Kaylin and I'm in eSports. My name is John Hopkins and I'm in Hoover High School's Drumline. My name is Zeus Reine and I'm in the Super Smash Brothers Club. My name is Sophia Kanja and I'm in Twirl. My name is Victor, I'm in Soccer. We just closed the books on an amazing 2017 I'm in Showdown. Thank you for joining us this morning and I hope you have a great rest of the afternoon. <laughs>